to officially hand it off to Wadi Sajas, who's going to be speaking to us um, about seed conservation and seedling preparation. And then we will be speaking with Raul. So welcome, Wadi. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing pretty well, Pamela. Thanks for everything as always. And I'm really glad to be one more time with all of you here sharing some of our experience and information. So today we can't with a uh, uh, luxury guest with, with, with Raul, who has been working in Puerto Rico, ecological uh, farming for, for more than a decade, especially producing in the, in the seed production. So for us, it's an honor to have him here and he will be sharing so valued information uh, in a few minutes. So I will be doing some introdu introductory part and let's move on to that. Okay, let's share my screen. Pamela, if you can uh, confirm that I'm sharing the right screen. I will thank you. Okay. Are we good? Yes, we perfect. Thank you. Oh, well, so today we will be talking about the seed conservation and seed preparation uh, and seed production too. So to begin this, uh, this conversation, we need to point of the importance of the seeds because seeds are so, so important that we, to see this, we need to go back just a little bit, just around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago when the humans start to make agriculture, right? Agriculture was the activity that set the basis as we see here for the foundation, for, for to start the civilization, right? Up to that moment, humans were uh, were being nomads. They were being moving from one part to other, hunting, fishing, and recollecting uh, some uh, some plants, including seeds, to feed them. Right. So uh, up to that point, uh, the civilization as we know does not exist. Right. So by that time, women especially women and women and I want to point this part were the ones that start to recollect those seeds and start to the domestication of those grains and start the, uh, to to cultivate those seeds up to the up to the point that they can start farming and the humans set the first uh, settles and, and the first uh, civilizations as we know that is why I want to point here with this uh, beautiful uh, paint about the, the this process of the woman's uh, planting and reproducing the, the, those seeds. This is where our modern crops start, right? So that was start to happen in, in this part of the world, in the in the what we know as, as part of the old world, right? Uh, in this half moon, it was known as the uh, as the uh, a fertile crescent. That today, that's the region where where Iraq, Iran, uh, Israel, Palestine, and the northern and the north of the of the Egypt exists. Right by this time, where the first civilizations uh, were start. Right, and if you look at this right picture, you can see the other important factor. It was that they were a uh, huge uh, rivers passing through that region because we need fresh water to make agriculture, right? So by this time, uh, it's where, where everything that we know now as farming start, including the, the domestication of the animals, but going back to the seeds, that it's what caused to have today a lot of variety of crops, a lot of variety of farm or, or, or fa farm animals, right? And that's the concept we know as agrobiodiversity. But first, and define what is agrobiodiversity, let's look what is biodi biodiversity. Biodiversity, previous, previously known and diversity of, biolo of biology, is um, it's the wide variety of existing plant, animal, microorganisms, but it also includes the genetic difference within each species, right? We can have the same species, but a lot of different variety of them. Just look how many type of cows we have. We have cows for milk, for meat, for their purpose. 
uh, uh, and for animal traction too, just for, for put an example. Uh, same happened with a lot of our crop as we will be seeing in the next slides. So the concept of bio, uh, agrodiversity, according to FAO, it includes of all of the bio, biological components relevant to our food and agriculture that make up the agro ecosystems. The ecosystems are just, just you, when you are walking around your farm, your farm, it's your, your small agro ecosystem, right? So that's include a variety of the components that sustain function, the structure, and the process of our ecosystem. So when we are talking about agrobiodiversity, uh, plus all of this variety of animals or of crops, we have other factors as, as our soils, the water, the weather, all of this that make all things that's happened and allowed us to produce food and other products that came from, from agriculture as, as uh, fiber, and at some point we are producing not now in a huge amount as a decade ago, uh, uh, biofuels and things like this, right? So right here, we can see part of this agrobiodiversity in terms of crops and where they belong, right? Because the agriculture start in this region that I show you a, a few moments ago, but later, a few thousand years later, it starts to happen in other parts of the world. And in each part of the world, depending of, their, of the characteristics they have, they, they were, and the plants, they, they, they were, by this time, people start the domestication of those plants, and that is why it is so rich. Then when the, uh, when the human start to, to travel in more often and the the uh, the colonization of other parts start the exchange of crops happen right and that's the reason why we have some crops that are indigenous from from uh, America but has a huge impact of, on the food culture in Europe one of them is it, it is the tomato and uh, I want just to say that we will be using the tomato as example uh, often today right so for example. The, at the beginning, the human and, and especially the woman start to, to see uh, what, what this, so, some kind of plants that in the, in the wilderness that have some properties, uh, not just for food, for medicine too. And they start the domestication and it, this is what it was look at the very right part of this picture. You can see the, the, uh, uh, the relative, the, the wild relative to, the, to, to what we know today as tomato. And, and you know, tomatoes have a lot of varieties, but just using this as example, right? By, natural, by selection driven by the, by the human hand, so it's, what, it's the way we get those mother crops that we use today, right? So this is an example for tomato. Let's see other one of our uh, most known crops around the world, but it is native from, from America, the, ma the maize or, or the corn, right? At your left side of the, of the picture, you can see the teosinte. Teosinte, it, it, it is the, the wild uh, relative or, or, the, or, or the ancestral from the mother corn, right? So if you can see there, the, uh, the, the, the ear that's structured like an ear, that you can say it's it it is not much more bigger than a quarter, right? So, but now we have this corn, this ear of corn that it is really big, and as we know, they are hundreds or thousands of varieties of corn, as well with the potatoes, as well with the rice, as well with many many crops. But because of industrial agriculture, we tend to just when we think on on one crop, we need to tend we tend to to. Uh, to think in uh, just a few varieties of that crop, right? But they are hundreds or thousands of this. So all of this process that begins 10 to 12,000 years ago in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the area that I show you is what we know in the modern science as a plant breeding. And it says that the plant breeding is the art because it is an art. <laughs> and a science of genetically improving plants for the benefit of the humanity. It is practiced, practiced around the world by professional breeders and farmers with centuries of proven results. That's, it is really important, right? Because uh, in the modern science, we have scientists that dedicated 
most part of their life to improve varieties of, of X amount of crops, right? But this is an, an empirical uh, knowledge that we have because since the humans start to make farming, we start the plant breeding, right? And that is what I want to point is the major part of all of this plant breeding that happened has been due to the uh, thanks to the to the farmers to the one which uh, work in the field day by day for centuries and centuries and the pass of those seeds and all those of those knowledge generation to generation right uh, and it is really important now because as it's mentioned here in the recent decades environmental pressure have become more frequent and intense due to accelerating climate change and plant breeding it's a critical part uh, of the solution what i want to 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 highlight here it is that all those crops that has been uh improved for for centuries so in my very own opinion are the answer for this new challenge that we are facing Many of, their, of those crops have all the genetic information to advance all of those challenges that we face with the, with the uh, global warming, right? So, but let's talk about a little bit of this for, uh, in, uh, in a few moments, right? So let's see here, as I've been mentioning for all that plant breeding or that, that selection or that agrobiodiversity, this is one example that you can see in this picture, look, that's amount of varieties of tomatoes right and you say oh wow i don't know how many of you has been seeing this before has have seen this before but for the one who didn't see this before i just want to to mention that probably this is not neither near to a quarter of the total amount of varieties that we have uh, of tomatoes right but for some reason especially after the industrial agriculture start start to spread we just, as I mentioned, we just uh, know one or two or three or five varieties to say any any number, right? What's that? That's imply all the modern or or industrial agriculture practices uh, did. It's that today the Food and Agriculture Organization from the United Nations recognize that the seventy five percent of that agrobiodiversity we have lost that because of the market because of that industrial uh, practices that that uh we has been using but we are in a good point of the history uh to preserve what we have and in sometimes we can rescue some of the of the varieties that we think that we have lost and and for example in puerto rico one of our participants of the food network Producer program uh, his name is uh luis uh with uh Luis Soto, he's a, a farmer that with a lot, a lot of experience. Uh, Don Luis Soto for the past 10, 15 years, he has been trying to rescue the varieties of our ancestor in Puerto Rico, what we call jíbaros, and to preserve them. I know Raul have some of seeds that are some kind of ancestral, ancestral seeds in Puerto Rico too. So this is important. The seeds, the, the agrobiodiversity, it's it's, it is a heritage of the humanity, right? So we need to preserve and, and to rescue and preserve uh, all of this uh, heritage, right? So there are some initiatives in the world to preserve all that agrobiodiversity that we, uh, that we are being talking. One of them, it is what you see here. I don't know if some of you have seen before, it's named the Global, Global Seed, Seed Vault located in the Norway Archi Archipelago. Uh, so there, it's supposed to be main, uh, most of our, mostly, not the total, but near to the total of our, of our seeds of all of the crops that we know today. And the purpose of this, it is if the, uh, it, it is something happened like some kind of doomsday or something like this, we need to have a reserve of those seeds to replant the world. But I don't know if you think having all those seeds in just one place is a good idea. But if you think this, uh, we are in a, in, a changing, in a changing world because of the climate as we know, because global warming, it's a reality. It is not that will happen, it's happening uh probably 
uh, we are facing the the the, uh, the global warming and the climate change for the for at least for for two decades now, right? So what's happened with this on 2017, four years ago, it's a start to uh, they they passed by a floated by a float there because of the of the higher temperatures, the snow start to melt and it start to float this route, right? So it is not a good idea to have all our our, our seats just in one place to preserve or in any seat bank. The best seat bank that we can have in the best way we can preserve the seats are in the hands of the producers, in hands of the farmers, in hands of the ones that are reproducing, reproducing and, conser and, and making the conservation of those seats. And that's the reason why today we want to, we have Raul here to share some of the experience for all of our participants and other people in this webinar to know how to preserve in the right way and propagate those seeds. Because as I mentioned, in the, in the, in the way we can save this is just by reproduction, the seeds, by having in our farms, by preserving, by planting them season over season and to exchange and share, and share those seeds with our uh, farmers' neighbors and with everybody, right? Other challenge that we are facing uh, in the seed preservation and to, to maintain that agrobiodiversity are the centralization and the co-optation of the seeds. So right here, you can see this diagram. It's it, this diagram uh, was done by a professor from Michigan State University, and it is uh, how the seed industry look around the globe. Right here are not all the seed, produ uh, seed, seed production companies, but many of them. As if you see from 1996 to uh, 2018, so Every time the cooptation of those six pro, uh, production companies has been in the hands of a few companies, many of them agrochemical companies, right? Is the one you, you see uh, here in, in, this, in this kind of, of red are agrochemical companies. So again, we are facing this challenge too to preserve our, our agrobiodiversity. And you know, if, if you control the seed market, you can control the food system of many parts. And that is not that what we don't want to strengthen the food system of the any part of the world of any country seeds needs to be in the hands of the farmers not in the hands of companies not just put in one seed bank you know in the hands of many many person that are using them right uh, saying this i just want to uh go back to to some concepts that we introduced in our first webinar of this series uh, when we was talking about the season plan, uh, planning of the harvest, I mentioned some of the concepts that I would just want to, to uh, go through them again, just to, uh, for you to have fresh on mind uh, before uh, Raul start to, uh, talking about it, right? So there are many kinds of seats in the market right now that you can access. So some of those seats are name it open pollinated seeds and open pollinated seeds are the seeds that you don't need to if you want if you buy those seeds and, or you update those seeds uh, just one time you can harvest seeds from the crops and every time you plant it you will have the same quality and the same uh, time type of crop right it is what it is uh, called open pollinated seeds in the open pollinated seeds, we can find some, some crops or seeds that you can say that they are named heirloom seeds. When we are talking of heirloom seeds, are seeds of open, poly, open pollinated seeds, but that has been, uh, has been in use for many, many years, for hundred, maybe for thousand years. So that's the reason or, uh, or what, that is the difference between open pollinated and heirloom seeds. A heirloom, it is an elder seeds and ancestral seeds but it is open pollinated variety too. The other things we can have, uh, we can find in the market in the seed catalogs are the hybrid varieties. Hybrid varieties all the time say, for, for example, if you uh, buy a variety of, uh, uh, of cantaloupe, that, that's its name, I, I trying to remember the, the one I used uh, several years ago. The name is Crimson. 
And this crimson variety, you, you can say uh, uh, in, at the site of the name that it's same crimson F1. So every time that you see F1, those are hybrid varieties. And, why, and what is a hybrid variety? A hybrid variety have two different parental varieties, right? And we cross them to produce this hybrid variety that we name F1. So we can plant those seeds, so those seeds just one time, because if we harvest those seeds from that F1 for that variety, when we plant this next generation, we will have a big, 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 big variety of the harvest uh, in the harvest, right? Right here, again, we have the tomato, this tomato, uh, it was a, a, a kind of, of exercise that, that, that someone did to show how different it looks when you harvest those seeds because what is happening, it is that, uh, that this net, next generation tend to, be, to, to look more from one of the parental varieties that we use to, to produce the, that F1, right? So that's a reason why using these uh, hybrid varieties uh, does not allow us to preserve seeds in our farm, right? So I'm not saying, so those varieties are, are bad, but if the purpose is to preserve your own seeds, they are not, they, they would not work for that, right? So it is not here, but the other thing that I want to, to explain are what is GMOs or genetically modified uh, organism or, trans, or transgenic crops. Transgenic crops are crops that uh, because of the hand of the bioengineering at the lab level, has introduced in their in the in their ADN some traits or some genes from other organisms, right? Or that at the at the lab level they were modified the, the their genome to show some traits. Uh, many 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 of the GMs in the markets are the, the main the main two varieties of GMO in the markets are Roundup Ready seeds that. Our seeds from corn, soy, cotton, and uh, I think sugar bit too, uh, to, to resist the application of the herbicides, right? So it's, they, they are not for more production. They are not have more nutrients. They just are modified for by, by chemical by chemical companies just to resist this. The other thing that you can find uh, really coming in the market of GMOs are corn that is it is BT corn and BT corn, it is a corn that have integrated in, the, in, in, the, in its ADN, a gene from a bacteria, a, a soy board bacteria named Bacillus thuringiensis. That's the reason why BT, that's produced a toxin that kill some worm, the, the, especially the army, the fall army worm that eat the ear of the, of the corn, right? But there are many plenty of varieties of corn of this the, uh, of ancestral variety of corn that, that have uh, adaptations that resist the attack, uh, attack of this pest, right? You know, GMOs nowadays in the market, they say that it is for, for fight the hungers, for the, the, uh, around the world, to, for the, the climate change, to fight all of this. And by now, they just show that it is a business to uh, make the farmers dependent of, the, of those kind of technology. Uh, GMOs are not uh, are really expensive seeds. Uh, it is it is heavy hard you to find these seeds in in any place or in any catalog. So there are so, some specific vendors that have these seeds. But uh, you know, for me and in my in my own opinion, we don't need GMOs to to fight hunger, to face the climate change, to to change the the, the way we are. You know that that is it's will not show any advantage the usage of the, from GMOs for for the last two decades, right? So in my opinion and my advice, it is let's keep going with our our traditional seeds. Let's keep preserving those seeds. Let's keep sharing those seeds with other ones, and um, that's that's the reason why, uh, and that will help us to to face all of those challenges that we have today with our food systems, right? So for now, this is all from my part and I pass the ball to Raul, but before, if anyone have question, 
uh, that's the time to make it. If not, just let's pass the ball to the, the ball to Raul. Thank you so much, Wadi. Um, at this point, um, we haven't had, I guess, any questions. Someone had asked about um, if we're going to be sharing this information. And yes, we will be sending an email post um, this webinar. So you will be able to access this information. Um, we don't have any questions at this point, but anyone that has any, feel free to share. We will be, um, after uh, we talk with Raul, we will be taking, taking another um, question and answer um, session. So definitely um, feel free to channel those via the chat or via the question and answer button so we could address those at a later time in the presentation. But now I am going to be then handing it off to Raul Rosado. He is the president of Desde Mi Huerto, which is an organic seed producer um, located here on the Western side of Puerto Rico. So um, without further ado, I will um, leave it off to Raul. Thank you Raul for being here today. Uh, I think we can't hear you. Okay, now. Uh, can you go. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, hi, hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Raul, as uh, Pamela and Wadis mentioned. Uh, I am a, a farmer, organic farmer here in Puerto Rico. I've been farmer since 2004. And at uh, the beginning, I mean, I never thought I would be a farmer, but then it happened naturally. So I've been farming for now for like 17 years and I love it. I really, uh, my whole life is uh, around farming as I guess you farmers also, right? we all, we all so passionate about our farming. And I started working with seeds uh, because uh, here in Puerto Rico, you know, we, we realized or when I started farming, it was very difficult to find uh, high quality seeds uh, other than just importing them or getting them, you know, from a catalog out, out, outside of the island. And I just realized that we needed, you know, to have our own seeds. We, we, we needed to have our own seed bank and to preserve varieties that are, that are from here and adapt other varieties from elsewhere. So we started doing that and, and you know, we've been saving seeds and we've been, we've been very grateful because as we started, we, we started meeting people and getting to know other farmers that just had like a special variety that, that they, they got from their, their father or their grandfather or the other persons. And we started saving those seeds and just, just making sure we don't lose our, our genetic, uh, you know, our, our, our seeds because that, that's something that happened before in our history. Uh, when when the, the the natural farmers when the people from the mountains started uh, fleeing from the mountains and just going to work in the industry they just left the farms and left the seeds and a lot of varieties were lost you know in the, in that movement and we just don't want we want to make sure that we have a all the varieties safe and also available for the public make sure that everybody has them and you know, in case uh, something happens and, and somebody loses them, it's not up to one person. It's it's up to the mo it's up to many farmers and other uh, home gardeners in their house that can have that variety, and they can freely they can freely multiply the seeds. That's not that's not uh, an issue. What, what we want to do is make sure that we have them available, and the people know where, where to get them. But we don't we we're not the seed owners. We're just you know we just like we just work with them. We just we're just happy to. To serve and to make sure that people have the seeds. Uh, uh, my company is called There's Demi Huerto and we're going to show you what we're going to talk to you today is uh, my experience and our experience here in the farm and what what have we done, how do we do things um, and what varieties uh, are commonly produced uh, or easily produced you know in in local farms or in the in home gardens okay. And we're gonna we're gonna start. What we basically work with is our op open pollinated seeds. Some of them are heirloom, like what is what mentioning heirlooms. They passed several generations, and we were we're so happy to have them. Uh, and all, other all of them and other are just uh, varieties that we that we managed to get from other people, other farmers, like uh, some some uh, collections on so or some other scientists, like like biologists that that they you know they made uh, new varieties here in Puerto Rico. And they are open for the public, and they were they work really good in our climate. And others we just we just got from the outside because it was very difficult to get seeds from in the inside of those varieties. And we are adapting them in the in the farm. 
But open pollinated seeds are basically seeds that are naturally pollinated by birds, insects, or winds. They do not have any interference with, with humans. We do not pollinate by hand. We do not do any crossings. We just let the seeds grow naturally uh, in our farm in Isabela, Puerto Rico. And the, the most commonly produced vegetable seeds in this weather, as you know, as, as our experience, uh, we have to understand a little bit of the of the science behind the names of the vegetables to understand, uh, you know, some of the things, uh, especially let's start talking with the curcubitacea. Uh, this is a cucumber, the pumpkin, a zucchini, a melon, watermelon, uh, the guido or the, or the gourd, uh, the lufa, the chayote. And these are varieties that, that this is a, a big family, the curcubitacea, and there's a lot of, of good hearty fruits we come up with that it, our, our clients you know they love cucumbers they love zucchini you know people in the farm markets they just love to buy uh, these type of, of fruits and it, it's important to know that even though it's a big family that you can plant them if you want to preserve a seed it's important that you plant if you're going to plant several varieties of the same uh, of, uh, for example cucumber if you have two or three cucumbers you need to be you need to keep them separated so they don't cross. You cannot, you know, cucumber cannot cross with a pumpkin, even though they are from the same family, or a cucumber cannot cross with a zucchini or a melon or watermelon because they're not the same variety. So even if the, even then they are in the same family, uh, they are different varieties and they won't cross each other. But if you plant two of the same varieties, two cucumbers, two pumpkins, two zucchini, they can cross. So you're gonna make, make sure that if you wanna preserve a seed, you want to make sure to you know to isolate it or to keep it separate. Plant one before and then plant another uh, type of cucumber, for example, uh, to keep them separated. Uh, another group, another family group, is the solanacea, which are the tomatoes, the potatoes, the eggplants, the pepper, hot pepper, seasoning peppers, which are also uh, fruits that the, our client, the clients, the people in the markets, they just love to have tomatoes. They just love to have eggplants, hot pepper, and seasoning peppers. And yeah, the same the same thing with curcubitacea. I mean, the, the curcubitacea, they need a lot of bees working on them. So it probably they cross more easily than the than the solanacea. But it's just to mention some of the seeds uh, or some of the groups that we are working on here on the farm. And others are the legumes, the beans, uh, the pigeon pea, the faba. Uh, those are very self self pollinated. They don't need they don't need a, a bee. They don't need the wind. They always you know the flower is very uh, especially with the bean, the flower is very, uh, poly it, it, it pollinates very fast, even as, as the flower grows, it self pollinates. Uh, the pigeon pea needs uh, the bee and, and we want to keep separate so we don't, we don't cross with others. And then we also have the corn. And as you know, the corn uh, 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 pollinates with the wind. So we wanna make sure if we have a windy place, we wanna make sure that, that you, if you're gonna separate, you're gonna keep different varieties separated. You wanna make sure uh, that that the wind, you know, it, it, it won't it won't move the pollen from one variety to another. So you got to keep them separated. Another one that we work is the hibiscus. Uh, we we call here Jamaica or the okra uh, are hibiscus, and they they self pollinate. Uh, the brassicas uh, they are they are they pollinate with the with the bees. So you want to also it's a big group the brassicas. You have the the broccoli and the cauliflower and the bok choy and the mustards and, and there's so many groups and some of them even that they are a little bit different like the broccoli and, and the kale and the cauliflower they can cross each other so you want to make sure to keep them separated but you cannot cross like for example broccoli with a mustard there are different varieties uh, different uh, different groups under under the brassicas so they won't cross and also the passiflora, the passiflora, you know, it's also a, a plant that mm -hmm. we grow here in the tropics and it's a delicious fruit, but it will also uh, cross pollinate. If you want to keep uh, the seed, you want to make sure you have the distance and also the basil. The basil is very easy to cross pollinate in between varieties. So uh, thinking of that and thinking of the group of the seeds and the, and the things, if you want to plant uh, same varieties and have them together, you want to keep some really good distancing between those. Uh, for example, the, the curcubitaceas need at least half a mile in between them. Uh, as I mentioned, not between the pumpkin and the cucumber, but uh, in between two types of cucumber or two types of pumpkin or two, two types of, of squash. And you know, be under, underneath some of them, there are, there are some exemptions. There are some varieties that we might think are cucumbers, but in reality, they are more under the melon family. So, so, so there are some 
uh, some some exemptions, but if you're gonna plant two varieties at the same time, you wanna keep at a good distance because the bees, they travel a lot and they could go, uh, they can cross the pollen from one plant to another one. Uh, the eggplants and tomatoes, uh, it's very difficult that they cross pollinate. They are, there are some extensions uh, as always, but we wanna keep them mainly 50 feet apart and that will, that will be enough. Uh, to keep them without without cross pollinating, uh, the bell pepper and the chili peppers, uh, the hot peppers or the seasoning peppers, we also work here. Uh, some of them are different varieties and they won't cross, but you got to make sure uh, that that what you're planting, if they are from the same family, you want to keep them 500 feet apart. If you're not keeping them 500 feet apart, uh, then you will you will have some crossing. Sometimes we see here that we have a sweet pepper, or and then when you try it, it's very spicy. It's because it cross. Uh, with another pepper that is from the same variety, from the same group. So you want to make sure uh, to study uh, the, the scientific name, the group or the, or the variety, because that will lead you to understand if, if it's going to cross or not. Uh, and legumes, for example, they auto, like I mentioned, they mostly auto pollinate. So we, we need maybe 50 feet in between and that will be okay for them to not cross. For corn, for example, especially if it's a windy place, you need at least a mile in between between one variety and the other one. So for, for not to cross. And this is this is a very, very important thing here in Puerto Rico. We have a lot of, of genetically modified corn growing in the south area. We have a lot of, of GMO companies over there. So you want to make sure, uh, you know, to keep your your organic sweet corn, our organic sweet corn separated at least a mile from these companies. And I think I think most of the organic farmers that we have in the island are, are not as close to those people. So we so our corn, I, I guess our, our natural corn is safe, at least uh, on that side of our organic farmers. And the brassicas also, they, they, they pollinate with bees and they will be half a mile to a mile and between varieties that can cross. Uh, the passion flower or the, or the passiflora, it's a, it, it has to be half a mile. The hibiscus self-pollinates, which is 50 feet maybe in between varieties, and the basil, uh, so the, the bees and the small insect that, that uh, pollinates this one don't, don't cross, we will need 150 feet. So you, as you see, these are these are measurements, but they are very extreme. But you know, my farm is not that big where I produce the seeds, so I don't really uh, use a lot of a lot of these ones. I think the the most that we use is the eggplant, the tomato difference, the bell peppers, and the chilies maybe. But we do not we do not plant this at the same time. The cu the cucurbitacea, the cucumbers, the squash. We do not plant many varieties at the same time because we don't have such a big farm uh, and, all, and also with the corn. So what we do with that is we, we, we try to maintain the purity of the seed by, by creating barriers like cages or nurseries or that we, we, can, we can cover the crops, we can, make a, we can plant some varieties inside a greenhouse that, that's close enough so the, so the, uh, the, the, pollinate, the pollen won't, won't affect the, the plants outside. We can we can build barriers like like tall plants in, in between smaller plants, uh, like like the picture that we see here. We see the corn on the edges, and then in between we can have another crops that that don't cross with another one, and that will help maybe maybe lower a little bit the distance. It won't be you know just like feet, five feet ten feet apart, but you can at least lower a little the distance between plants if you have some barriers. Um, another thing is to plant against the wind. Uh, you know if you want to plant a corn. Uh, and then and then plant two corns. So you want to make sure that that one don't pollinate the other. You can you can use the wind as your favorite. That so so it doesn't it doesn't blow this pollen to the other one. But then you know this is for the seed we want to save. So this can blow into the other one because the other one is just for eating. Is just for uh, for commercial use for sale. We're not gonna save the seed. But then this one we want to save the seed. So we want to make sure you know we can uh, we can use the wind in our favor. Uh, also, and this is the most, uh, the, the, the barrier that we use the most is planting in different times. Just, you know, we plant one cucumber uh, maybe in October, November, you know, at the beginning of the season. And then we plant another cucumber in February when the other one ends. And, and you know, that, that sort of thing works really good, especially with, with us small farmers. We don't need to, to fully produce a lot of varieties of the same one is very difficult and, and most of the seed companies they don't produce uh, a lot of the of the same varieties they just buy from other farmers you know one farmer grow one variety and another farmer grow another and then you know the seed companies they buy the produce and get the and get the seeds done 
so definitely definitely planting in different times helps uh, but at the same time here in Puerto Rico that we want to use like the most of the season that we have which is uh, from October to June or July so we want to make sure we use uh, that that that, uh, that refreshing weather here in Puerto Rico to mm -hmm. to plant most of the vegetables that we that we eat uh, so that's very important and also another another barrier that we can use is just placing bags in top of the flowers uh, we can pollinate them uh, uh, as we choose, and and then just make sure we put the bag so so we don't we don't cross pollinate mm -hmm. with another one. Uh, we do that here in our farm, especially with with some corns. Especially if you want the corn is, is a pretty easy uh, plant to to pollinate. Uh, but sometimes we just we just want to make it better. We want to make a, a corn a corn seed that somebody that, that we bring and we're trying. We want we want to see if it grows well. Uh, for example, we have a blue corn that that was brought to us from Peru. And this corn, it some of the plants are higher, some of the plants are smaller. They're not. It's not. It's not yet as as regular as it should be. So what we do is we we try to get the bigger plants, the pollen from the bigger plants, uh, in a bag, and then we put the bags in top of the all all the plants. So we make sure that what we pollinate the plants are only with the big size, the bigger high quality corn, and we get a better seed. Uh, so that can be done with the bags. The bags help us to protect from the other pollen of the smaller plant that we don't we don't want. That, that's not the quality that we want. And we use the bags to to really cover and make sure to add the pollen to these uh, these other seeds. So we're not we're not doing a lot of science here. We just want to make sure that we have uh, the the strongest variety and the strongest seed to offer our clients. And that's that's what we do, uh, basically. And another thing, you know, after the harvest and the handling is very important to preserving the seed, especially because because anyone can harvest the fruit, anyone can harvest the seed and just like like dry it out, you know, on top of the table, and then you can save it in a bag, and that's perfect. But if you if you don't follow and, and dehydrate and and make sure the humidity is out, the seed won't last as much as it should. So we want to make sure to follow to follow some steps. Uh, except, for example, the dry seed, uh, which is mostly the corn, the legumes, the sunflowers, um, and the, the brassicas and the hibiscus, you know, they all come, they all come in, in a dry format. When they dry, we just need to, to make sure it's dry enough. We make sure it's, it's very dry, the seed, and then we separate seed from the coat or from whatever is covering it. We can do that winnowing it or sifting it uh, and just, or just blowing, you know, just blow, make sure the, blow, the, the wind blows on it. And then after we have all the seed clean, we kind of select, you know, the bigger, the biggest seed or the or the stronger seed, the harder one. We have to want to pressure it. We want to make sure we have strong seeds, and and you know we 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 do that and we and then we save them. That's that's the way to to do it. We want to follow. If we leave the seeds with a little bit of of, of the coat or the or the pulp or whatever it's covering it, it it'll get moldy with time. It will get it will, it can get uh, insects trying to eat it, eat the the dry pulp or the dry coat out of it. it it can be like something uh, that the insect will use to live like to to put the eggs in it so we want to make sure to make sure to have the seed as clean as possible without any stems any leaves anything that will cover it and when we're when we're working with wet seeds when we have to harvest make sure we harvest at the peak maturity like in the picture right there of the tomato you can see that the green tomato we can see the the kind of greenish orange a half mature tomato and then we see like a fully mature tomato where we want to make sure we, we get the seeds of the really really mature tomato that got mature not in the kitchen not in the in the floor we want to make sure it matures in the in the plant to make sure that the the modern plant give it all the juice all the nutrients so the seed is a strong it's a hardy one and and it'll get all the all the dna information Okay, because if we harvest the seed, you, it, the, the green fruit, for example, you can see that the seed is there, but it's still, it's still not, it's still attached to the mother. It's gonna be difficult to get it out, to separate it from the pulp. It's gonna be difficult to ferment it, uh, which is uh, the process that we do with, with the water, with the, the humid uh, fruits, with the humid seeds that come in, in humid fruits. Uh, when you harvest seed and when it's not mature, it's very difficult to separate and it's very difficult to clean because it's not ready. It's not, it's not there ready to be detached from, from, from the mother fruit, from, the, from what it's, it's keeping it there. Okay, so it's very important that we, that we always harvest at peak maturity. 
if we want to, if we want to, for example, save seeds of a certain crop of a certain variety of pepper, for example, you make sure you have the best looking pepper, the best looking plant, the healthiest looking plant, and the biggest pepper, and the, you know the 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 one that you really you the, the one that should be the 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 seed or the or the fruit that you want to sell that you want to have in your farm. So you want to make sure you harvest that best fruit, and then break it apart, which is you know, a little bit sad, you break apart something so beautiful, so perfect, but you, you're breaking it apart because, because it, it has another purpose. It's not going to the market. It has a, a different purpose. It's a, it's a more, uh, more important purpose to make sure that that seed is going to be the mother for the next generation of plants that you're going to plant in, in your, in your garden. Uh, so you want to make sure you have the best seed for that. You break it apart and then you separate seed from pulp as much as you can. You see here in the in the, one of the pictures, you see uh, the lady, where some ladies cutting the small peppers. And you see what you see in the water is mainly the seed. You don't see the pulp. You don't see the the the, the edges of the uh, of the peppers. You just see uh, the seed floating in the water with a little bit of reddish a liquid, which is normal. That is the the pulp that is attached uh, to the seed. Uh, so if you separate it the best before you add it, you put it to ferment, it's going to be easier to clean at the end. So you make sure you get all the pulp out, all the edges, all the, the edges of the fruit. And then you put that in water and you'll just leave it to ferment. The, depending on the fruit, depending on what you're using, the fermentation process will be maybe 24 hours, can be 48 hours, can be 72 hours, or it can be maybe a week or 10 days. Uh, to ferment depending on, on the vegetable or the fruit. I see in fruit trees that are just, they take too long. They take at least 10 days to separate from the pulp. Uh, some fruits, they take longer. And you want to make sure that fermentation process work and clean the seeds because uh, the fermentation, the, the, the bacteria, the bacteria or the mold that, that comes in that fermentation process, it will eat the juices. It will eat the, the sweetness. It will clean the seeds of that liquid that is preventing it. It's, it's some, some natural liquid that is just prevented from, from sprouting inside the fruit. And we wanna make sure we clean that because then uh, when we wash and when then we dry, uh, we dry and save it, uh, that seed will, will last longer because it, it doesn't have as much, uh, it doesn't have the pulp, it doesn't have the sweetness. So the, the mold that could happen to that seed when it's storage, when it's in, in storage, it won't happen because it's very clean. So you want to make sure you do that fermentation process uh, pretty well. Um, and then you wash the seed, you really wash the seed in some, in some uh, sifters and some uh, colanders, you know, you, you just make sure you add a lot of water, you make sure that seed is very clean, and then you put it to dry or, or dehydrate inside a greenhouse, maybe in a, in a, in a nice place when, with a little bit of sun. Here in Puerto Rico, we, we use the sun a lot because the, the humidity is very strong. Uh, so that's that's something uh, to think about, uh, or you can just leave it in the kitchen in a in a windy place, or or you know let next to maybe a fan with a with a soft air blowing it blowing to it, but you want to make sure not to use paper. You know you you don't put it in top of a napkin. You use maybe a plate, maybe a, like a hard a, a hard um, base for for easier to separate into you know from the from that base or from that plate. And you can easily, easily store the seeds later. Um, so like, like I mentioned, the dry seeds that we were mentioning uh, of the ones that we mentioned at the beginning are the legumes, the corn, the hibiscus, the brassicas, the basil. And if you see the, the, bean, the bean picture, you see how green it is at the beginning and then it starts you know, maturing and dividing the bean in, in the stalk. You see the division and then you see it mature, they get yellow and then and that, that yellow part is, is if you're gonna eat it, if you're gonna sell it for, for food, that, that's definitely the part where you should, where you should harvest. But if you're gonna harvest from seed, you need to harvest them dry. You don't dry, you don't harvest them yellow and then let, leave them mature outside. We want to make sure they dry in the plant. At least that that you know that that beginning of drying is very important to have it in the plant, uh, so the seed can absorb all the nutrients, all the humidity, everything it needs to do uh, for it to to save the DNA information and for it to be to be important and, and to be last to, to last long the, the germination percent. 
and we with the with the wet seeds we we have the solanaceas, uh, which are the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplants, and the curcubitaceas, and we also have the passiflora. We have the the the, the papaya, also is, uh, one of the varieties that we grow with uh, humid. And you know, sometimes uh, if you see a tomato and then you see a pepper, you may think that the seed of the pepper, it's, it's more drier than the tomato definitely, but it's still in a humid environment. So you wanna make sure you ferment that for a couple of days. The peppers, they, they take at least three days to ferment, even though they don't have water or anything, but it, it does have like, a, like a, a clear coat around the seeds that will protect it or prevent it from sprouting and it could get moldy. It could get very moldy very fast when you save tomato seeds and uh, pepper seeds and you don't, you don't ferment them well. So you wanna make sure, even though you may think it's not wet enough, but it is inside a wet fruit. So it, it's gonna be necessary to be fermented. And that's very important. Uh, the papaya seeds, they don't come in a watery solution, but each seed has its own watery solution covering the seeds. So you wanna make sure we have all the seeds together. We add a little bit of water and just leave it for a man until that coat gets soft and you, it's easy to break and you get a clean seeds underneath that, okay? Uh, for storing the seeds, you need basically two conditions. We need a cool place or and a low, a low humidity. And low humidity, I think, is the most important. Uh, having a cool place would make, a, would make the seed last longer. But if you have a cool place and it's humid, it won't last longer. You need to have both uh, both to be able to preserve the seeds. A cool place can be a refrigerator, a freezer, but only a freezer if you're going to store the seed for a longer period of time. If you're not going to use it every month, every week, you know, that's the seed you want to put in the freezer. It's something that you're going to, okay, this seed is good. We're going to save it for next year. Okay, we're going to store it right there and we're not going to get, get it out of the freezer. We're not going to be in and out, in and out because that change of temperature is going to damage the seeds. Okay, so that's very important. Uh, if we're going to use the seed every every month, you know, we want to keep it maybe in the refrigerator, maybe best in a, draw, in a drawer or a cabinet, you know, just in bottles like this or bags uh, like the ones underneath. But another, another good place to put the seeds are burying them in the ground. You want to make sure you put them in a, in a good sealed bottle and you can put them in the ground, not, not like inches underneath the ground, maybe, you know, like, like a feet or more. So we make sure that the sun doesn't heat up uh the the cans or the bottles and we make sure we, we keep the, the cool place of the of the seeds now to keep the low humidity you can use vacuum sealed bags or vacuum sealed bottles i, th I think they, they sell that uh, very openly uh or just a sealed uh, bag just like this like a ziplock or, or a jar and and you can put inside you can use some silica or you can use some rice uh, the rice is a pretty good uh, humid absorbent uh, you know, you can do that. You can have it there for a while and then take it out after you think that most, most of the humidity is gone. Uh, make sure to open the bottle up to take the silica out or the rice. But you want to make sure you do that in a very dry day. Don't, don't do it in a, hum in a humid day because then the air with all the humidity will, will end up in there anyway. So we want to make sure uh, to get the most humidity out that will make uh, the seed last longer. And that's really good. How much time can the seed last? Well, I mean, it depends. And uh, you know, as, as I mentioned in the cleanliness and the conditions, but the legumes can last up to four years, the corn up to five years, hibiscus two years, the brassicas can, can last up to five years, basil up to five years, uh, solanaceas between two and five, curcubitaceas between five and 10, and the passiflora two years. So if you, if you have a good storage, if you, if you have a good place, a good conditions, you will have seeds for years. But as, as what is mentioned, uh, you know, just saving seeds in a, in a freezer, saving seeds in a refrigerator, it won't, it won't do, it won't, I mean, it can help a little bit for the future. You want to always have something there. But the most important is the seed that we, we are refreshing and always changing and always adding to the freezer. And every year, keep, keep changing and keep saving seeds all the time. That will help us uh, make sure that we don't run out of years, you know, we're not going to just plant, plant the legumes that we, we had four years ago. We want to make sure we have fresh every year. That's very important. And also because the seed is going to have DNA information of the conditions it grew. And if we keep getting, you know, climate change, uh, harsh, harsh weather, more humidity or more sun, we want to make sure that that DNA, that, that, that seed is strong every year and keeps getting strong with, uh, with the, the genetic information being 
being fresh every year. Okay. Uh, you can do germination tests. This is something that, that are the seed companies do to make sure that what we're selling, it's, uh, it's, it's good, it's a good seed. And, you know, so we, we can take a, just a representative sample, uh, maybe from a big bag, we make sure we get some from the bottom, some from the top, some from the middle, from the edges. And we make sure to plant at least 10 seeds, at least 20 seeds, and that will be a, a very good representation. And then what we do is we count how many sprouted, how many germinated, and we divide that quantity by the total we, we sow. You know, if we have, a, if we put 20 seeds to sprout and only 10 sprouts, then we know we have a 50% germination. And if you have 15 that sprout, we have 75% of germination in that in that bag. Uh, so we want to make sure we we check we check maybe uh, every six months, every year if if it's something that you want to store for a long period of time, we can we can do the, the germination test every year uh, to make sure that what, we, what we're saving is still, I mean, it, it works. It's not occupying space that we can use with new seed. Uh, so that's something to do. Um, and there, you know, there are other types of seed that we grow here and, and it's very important here in the tropics. I think seeds, uh, the bulbs and the cuttings are a very important seeds for us here because that's a way that we can, uh, we can preserve and do and exchange seeds easier. And there are some varieties that they just don't produce uh, seeds sexually just by cross pollinating. So the way is to use the bulbs and the bulbs and uh, we can usually get them by separation or the division of cutting or cutting the, the rice, the rhizomes, uh, you know, and we, we, can, we can separate them or we cutting and then we plant them and we have a new plant. And the, the good thing about the bulbs, they are easy to propagate. You just get a, get a bulb and bury it basically. Uh, and you know because it's a bulb and it has uh, it has uh, sugars and it has uh, you know some some kind of lifespan, it will last maybe for a month, a few months, if we keep it on a good condition, uh, humid and stored uh, or or dried, but you know not so humid so it won't rot. And so we want to make sure we keep it in the in the best uh, time. But the best way to to keep a bulb is is just plant it in the ground. Uh, like cuttings, cuttings is, is basically a piece of a stem or a leaf that we can use to plant. Uh, some varieties they grow from leaf, they are very, very strange. It's not all varieties that grow from leaf. But by stem, we can do cuttings of different plants. Uh, the only thing with the cuttings is they have short, uh, short lifespan. So if we do a cutting, I mean, the, the idea is to, to try to root it or to put it in the ground as fast as we can. So it so make roots and make a new plant. And the best way is to store the cuttings is just keeping a living plant in the garden. It's the best way to, to keep them. They, they won't last, uh, they won't, they won't uh, sheep well, you know, if you want to send them elsewhere, they won't. It's very difficult. So you want to make sure to keep a living plant in the garden always so you keep getting uh, cuttings from that plant. And some of the bulbs that we use here in Puerto Rico are the banana, the plantain, uh, the yautia or, or taro, uh, malanga de lerenes, which is a small, a very small potato that the Taino brought into the island. Uh, the ginger, the jam, the turmeric, shallots. Uh, we, we have a good variety of shallots here in Puerto Rico that our ancestors used to grow. Uh, potatoes are also a good bulb and the peanuts. Uh, they also, they grow, you know, from the peanut itself, which is, is it's a legume, but it's, it grows underneath the ground. So, you know, you just plant that. It's a seed, but also, uh, kind of like grow underneath the ground. So, so we put it here in this, in this category. Um, and also the cuts or the cuttings, we can do that with the sweet potato, with the yuca or cassava. Uh, we can do that with different herbs like the rosemary, the oregano, you know, lavender, mint, and other flower and other, other herbs, uh, medicinal herbs, uh, culinary herbs. They are easily propagating with, with, the, with the cuttings. Also with flowers or ornamentals, it's very easy to, to, uh, to, to produce by cutting. Some people use hormones uh, on the roots. Uh, we usually, we don't, we don't use hormones, uh, but yeah, it's something that people do. And you can also do cuttings from, from tomatoes, small tomato plants that are growing. You know, sometimes we have to cut, cut the suckers out of the tomato. We can use those suckers and we, we can root them and we can make more plants out of the, out of the small growing tomato plants or peppers also. Uh, but also we can do that from the fruit trees. We can take a, a lemon tree that's already producing and after it finishes uh, producing, we can take cuttings out of it and make new plants or, you know, mango trees and stuff like that. The only problem with the fruit trees is that they grow big and tall and the cuttings, they usually don't have 
a big strong root that will keep them strong and firm with the wind and the hurricanes and all that. So if we do a cutting of the trees, we want to make sure to have like some kind of, of structure around it to hold it because it's definitely going to fall uh, with just uh, you know a medium to strong wind is going to fall. And that's why people make crafting. That's why people uh, invented the crafting just because they want to make sure to have a strong root uh, of that seed that sprouted and then that cutting basically gets gets on the on the stem of the seed that is growing and then you have like a like a young root but like an old old branch to make sure the the fruit trees uh, produce faster but also make sure to have the root that is needed for to you know to sustain the wind and to sustain the different weathers uh, thanks pam uh, thanks raul for the that old valuable uh information uh pam are we seeing the right screen yes we are okay thanks now so for for to end this webinar today we will be uh talking briefly once we have the seeds how to make seedlings how to prepare uh successful seedlings right so we need basically three components uh aside of the seeds to make good seedlings right uh, there are some or or they are uh some crops that we plant direct the seed in the soil so that's how, what, what we name the red seeding but um there are many others especially vegetables and short and and short uh season crops that we can make seedlings right seedlings have um some advantage um sorry maybe I Okay, let me go back. Okay, so seedlings have some advantage than just to the direct seed, uh, seeding, right? So some of them is that we have a uniform and a hardened plant for transplanting to, to take them to the field that uh, secure us and assure to us to have a more... Uh, so uh, so uh, more... So that, that that's will... We'll, help us to have more success with our has harvest, including more uh, a, a mo uh, more efficient efficiency in, in the in the field, right? So we use the uh, that help us with the efficient use of the space because we are advancing uh, a, a period from from two to six weeks of the crops when we when we make seedlings that we have this space in our farm free to keep production to advance this because when we take these plants these the seedlings ready to the field so they are around two or, or, or two to six weeks uh older right depends of, of, of the kind of crops we are doing for example with we are dealing with with uh, cucumbers uh pumpkins squash melons and things like this uh in average, from two to three weeks are the, 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 the time that it's take to take the seeds into the field. But in the other hand, if we are dealing with other crops like um, tomatoes, peppers, um, which other ones, lettuce, uh, broccoli, or things like this, that will take around to 30 to, to 40 days that we need to have them in the, in the trays to transplant to the, to, uh, to the field, right? So that's help us to less uh to, to to lose less seeds right because when we are doing direct seeds in the open field sometimes for the heavy rain events or something like this we can or or by because of insects or other animals we can lose seeds right and seed it's one of the our operational cost uh and it's in place in place time too when we when we lose those seeds in the field once we we plant it right so among other other benefits that we can have by using seedlings right so what we need to to make those seedlings we need a grown medium a grown medium that could be peat moss is one of the most or widely used uh peat moss is yeah it's a product that came that come many uh or mostly from from canada it's not so sustainable to keep using it uh, because the the amount of of the of the of those uh, mines where where peat moss is harvest has been going down so fast. So there are other options that we can use uh, on the islands. It's it's uh, commonly to to find 
what we call named cocoa peat. That cocoa peat it, it, it is all the all the husk from from the coconut. When when uh, when they shredded the coconut, we they process process the, this by product and make a, a some kind of, of material that looks like and works like the pit moss, right? So other thing that we can use is, it is compost or even soil, right? So if you if we are using soil that we need to secure that soil, it is uh, pest free um, and see and free from seeds uh, of weeds, right? So a good way to make it when we are using soil, it is uh, use the, the power of the sun. So you, I, I advise to cover the, the, this pile of soils with a plastic and let them there uh, exposed to the direct sunlight for around one or two weeks. That's will, the, the temperature increase will help us to fight against any pathogens or, or weed seeds. Uh, as well with, with, with compost, right? So right here we have the agro medium, this is uh, pit moss. So you can find uh, a wide variety of this kind of products, right? Sometimes we, you can buy just the pit moss, but other times you can find it in the market, mix it with perlite and vermicul and vermiculite uh, that the most commercial brand that you can find it, it is Promix sometimes have some inoculum of microorganisms or, or mycorrhizas or something like this, but sometimes you can use it just, uh, you can bite just the, the pit moss, right? Uh, when you are using compost in this case as the same as the same example with soil, you need to use or, or, or it will be used so mature compost and passed by a mesh that secure us that we are using a very fine material, right? In my experience for the past uh, four, four or five years, uh, I prefer to use a mix of pit moss with or cocoa pit with compost that's help uh, that uh, help to decrease the uses of pit moss uh, as well that it's uh, this support some nutrients to the mix and and in in my case so since I start to make this my seedlings are stronger. Uh, our greener are better than ever, right? Because uh, we are securing that we have some nutrients in that mix. So my recipe, and I always mention here, uh, I share some of my knowledge and, and my experience and some information too. Uh, in my case, I like to, to make a mix of 50-50, 50 compost, 50 pit, pit moss or cocoa pit. And that's it for me, the, the, the mix that, that uh, works for me right so i always say it is on my in, in my case it, it is my experience because the things that work for me are may, maybe does not work as well for for all of you right so i always point that we need to make our own tries in our own form right so after uh, the other thing that we need to to make to to make the seedlings are the container for germinations it's mostly common use or, or the most uh, of the commonly uh, uh, use of, uh, of this kind of recipients are the, the plastic trays as the, the ones we see here. Uh, in my case, is are the, the ones that I, I always use in Puerto Rico. They are widely used for, uh, for the seedlings and you can find them in many versions, right? So mainly what different the, the, the difference, difference between them are the, the amounts of plots or, or the cells in each trace. So which one is better for you? Uh, we can have someone from 90, 98 uh, cells for 72, 58, 40 something up to 20 something or 12. That's all depends in the size of the, of the crop you are using too, but as, as I mentioned in my experience for many vegetables uh, that I've been uh, that I grow for, for some sometimes in, uh, during the year, I prefer to use the 72 plus ones that works for, for small seeds and small plants like lettuce, like mescum, uh, or for other bigger ones like uh, like broccoli or cabbage or even for uh, pumpkins that we know that the plant is kind of, of, of big, right? But if you are using 
and a smaller cell for pumpkin, be sure that you transplant this uh, plant to the field uh, once they they reach the the uh, the right size. Because if you left there, uh, the plants will pass for some stress that can could be them uh, experience some damage in the root systems, and you don't want this, right? In average, and in my experience, most of the Cucurbitaceae family uh, of plants, uh, in two weeks, they are ready to, to be transplanted to, to the soil. You know, the cucumbers, the, uh, the pumpkins, the squash, the zucchini, all of them, right? Uh, and it's work. You know, those this material, if, if you don't manage, uh, it is not just a one-time use material, right? It is plastic, and and that imply in especially for our islands to have more trash. If you want, if you you if you just use one time and then you put into in the trash can. So we don't want this. Uh, I can say you, I have been using the same trays for around four years. In sometimes, when I use it, uh, if if they don't don't break. I, what I do, do it, it is I put them in a solution of 10% of Clorox uh, with water, left them overnight there. Then I rewash with fresh water and left them uh, and left them dry in the direct sun for two or three hours. Once I storage in a in a dry cool place, and you can use it uh, season to season to season, right? Uh, other trays that are commonly used are the styrofoam ones. Uh, they are commonly used in, down here in Puerto Rico, uh, right here in Puerto Rico, but not so common. But uh, if you are using those one too, you know, styrofoam, it, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, implied to produce more, more trash. So my advice is again, as, the, as I mentioned with the plastic one, just to reuse this material, right? So now you can find on the market or online market, so are more commonly to find it some biodegradable trays uh, but you know, so by now the, the cost is a, a little kind of, of, of high. So, and I want to, to, to use this opportunity. If any of you knows about, about trays that are biodegradable with a good price, please share this information with us, right? That will be really help, uh, helpful, right? Other thing that we can use as container for, for produce seedlings are the seed beds. So right here, we are looking some ones that are more like a rustic, uh, that, that were made in a rustic way to using, reusing uh, wood, but uh, you can find it or you can build it using iron, making in, in a sort of much pro way. But when we are using this kind of container, sometimes the plants can suffer uh, damage on the root system because when they do, does not have any kind of division, the roots, if you don't transplant it the right at time, the roots start to make a web among of, all of the root system of, all, of the plants. And then when you are separated plant by plant, you can damage the, the root system and that could uh, lead to the loss of the plants or, the, or any attack of, of any uh, or of insects or any um, any other problem that implies the health of, of the plants, right? So and the stress and the stress of transplanting uh, will be will be bigger, right? So that's the way I don't I don't in, in my personal opinion I don't like to use this kind of, of container. But if you are using or if you want to try, so just go 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 and do it and 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 see what, what's worked for you, right? I'm not saying that they, they, they don't work well for, for other people, right? I'm just talking about my experience. So other containers that we can use are reusable material like this one, uh, like we have here, the, 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 uh, the ones that, we, that are used for, for egg transportation, we can make some holes in, in the, in the, in, uh, in the in in I, I for in the floor in the part of the floor of the container you you just can drill some some holes and use as container for for germination too if 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 it if it it's work for you right so but always make sure uh, and make sure you that 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 
the container you're using have enough room, uh, room to for the plant to develop the right amount of uh, the, the right size of the root system, right? The other thing that we need to have is a germination area or a nursery. So the things that we ha need to have on mind when we are uh, in uh, making the determination where we will, we, will, we will be placing the nursery are the location, the location where you have the nursery uh, needs to have a direct sunlight for no less than six hours a day because light, it is one of the main uh, things that seeds needs to, uh, to, uh, to germinate, right? So if you, don't, if you place your germination area or your nursery in a, pla in a place where you have a heavy shadow, the plants tends to grow so elongated searching for lights and you will have thin plants that are not in the good shape to be transplanted to the, to the, uh, to the field, right? So direct sunlight, it is really important. Uh, at least you need to have six hours. Uh, it, it, is, it is best if you have eight hours of direct sunlight. And what I mean for direct sunlight, it is that area you can see the path of the sun during the day for not less than six to eight hours, okay? Uh, other thing that you need to, to, to have in consideration when, when you are determining, uh, making the determination of the location of the, of the nursery, it, it is the ability, uh, the availability of water, right? Because without water, we, can, we cannot produce. But have in mind that the medium that you have for each plot or for each seedling, it is not like half the plants in the soils, in the field that you have plenty of soils that can hold water. So the capacity to hold water of this medium uh, is really, uh, it's kind of small. So you will need to water your plants at least two times a day. When you are watering your, your seedlings, I really advise not to make it uh, near to the, to the sunset hours, right? Just water the, the, the seedlings with enough time uh, or enough sunlight remaining to remove the excess of water because if you increase the humidity in your nursery, it is probably that you face some problem, especially uh, with, uh, with some fungus, uh, with some pathogens that, that mainly from, from fungus because they, uh, in the tropic, we know they are plenty of, of them in, in, our, in, in the air of the uh, uh, of fungus that can damage our crops. So the other thing that you could consider it, and, and it is highly recommended to have protection for those seedlings. As we see here, the nursery, so sometimes it is highly recommend, uh, recommended to have a greenhouse for same in some way. The greenhouse that you can build one for not, we, you don't need to have an expensive one. So right here, you can see two models that you can have it for, for low amount of money. So the right one are all completely built on PVC pieces, uh, but this picture, it is not suitable for, for, the, for the tropic, right? Because it is all wrapped with plastic. So instead of plastic, the walls of this, uh, it's better if you use what we call saran or, or the mesh, we, we use it. So to allow the pass through the air and down the temperatures inside of them. It's more recommended to have this as, as the, the one we have on of the left. So you can make it in a variety of ways, in a variety of material. And I just want to, to show this one make from bamboo here. Uh, so just to, to let you know that you don't need to spend a lot of money or, or make it the traditional ones that you see that are really expensive, right? So you can use a whole variety of materials to make it. In this case, this one is really well built. Just using bamboo is, you know, a, a really sustainable material, by the way. But you can reuse wood. You can use whatever you have at hand to to build it up. Right? If you search on the on the web, you can find a lot of models that you can build by yourself for a low cost. Right? So. 
from my part, that has been all. If you have any question about seed, seedling production or, or from seeds, uh, we're here, me and Raul, so we can uh, answer them. So once again, thanks to everybody for, for being here and press attention. And thanks to Pamela, Saimar, and, and Raul for help to have this, uh, this great webinar today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wadis. Well, we've given you a ton of information. I know you must be a little bit overwhelmed and we apologize, but we get excited about all of the subjects that we share with you here. Um, at this point, again, asking if anyone has any questions, anyone would like to share any comments about um, either anything that Wadis might have shared, anything that Raul might have shared. Um, now is the time um we are giving it one more call for anyone that might be interested in providing with their comments or questions i thank you so much Wadis, for providing um all of those amazing resources same with raul raul thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, with all of our participants from the bahamas from the usbis and beyond we're very happy to be um, connecting um, all of the different regions within the Caribbean and, and to be talking about food security, to be talking about all the different tools that might make us more sustainable and that might empower us to continue producing our food in that way. So I am very happy for this session. Um, we have a couple of um, comments around. Thank you for the information. Thank you so much for joining us um, as usual, Tiffany. Um, I believe we don't have any questions. I think you guys are very clear. Thank you. I don't know if you guys have any um, closing comments, anything that you'd like to share, any remarks? I don't know, Wadis or um, Raul? Well, yeah, I just I just want to say uh, seed saving is it's something that everybody should do, every farmer, especially if you want to make sure, we want to make sure that we, we keep the seeds safe for the future, for the future generations. That's something that I think our ancestors take for granted and they didn't do, maybe some of them did, maybe not all of them as they should. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that, that we do the seed saving because it's very, very easy to lose a variety. It's very easy to lose a type of seed if you don't if you don't save seeds, definitely. And then you, we will all be looking for seeds and you know there'll be, uh, there'll be a handful of them and we wanna make sure we preserve our own, especially in these difficult times with the COVID, difficult times, uh, especially with the, with the rough weather that we receive in the Caribbean with the hurricanes, we wanna make sure that in those times, the seeds are already saved. You know, the, that's something that happens uh, with me and Maria, that we we received the hurricane, but we, we at least we had harvested a lot of seeds earlier that year. We had a full uh, room, cooler room full of seeds that we managed to save and, and and be able to reseed the population, the, the farmers of Puerto Rico and the, and the Caribbean. So we, the saving seed is, is super important for everybody. So, you know, I just want to make that clear and, and thank you for, for being here and taking your time to listen to this, to our, our experience. Thank you. Thank yes, uh, my, I just want to, to point to the, to, the, uh, to, the same, to the same things that Raul was just saying. Um, after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, uh, some, a few weeks later, I was visiting uh, a, friend, a friend that he's a farmer. And he was telling me that, that uh, part of the, of, uh, while the hurricane was passing, pass of that time, he, he was making some seedling trays. And he were har harvesting around five weeks after the heat of the hurricane, right? So I just mentioned this as a, as a example because seed preservation, seed conservation in the hands of the farmers are one more tool to face this uh, reality that we have uh, now that, uh, you know, that, that, that it is a big challenge for our food security uh, in, in the Caribbean region, right? So I just want to mention this as, a, as an example and, and invite all of people here to, to start or keep preservation your seeds, make seeds change and, and spread the seeds all around, right? So 
once again, thanks for, for lend your, your ears and uh, to us to hear this. Okay. So as always, we are at, at your orders here and thanks for everybody to, to, for, for being here. And, and thank you, Pamela, for organizing this. Again, thank you, Waris. Thank you, Raul. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening. I just shared via the chat also um, our, our programs page, the Food Producer Network. As I mentioned earlier, we do have an open call for grants until this Friday. So feel free to share with anyone that you know who might be interested in applying. We are providing grants from $5,000 to $20,000. So again, feel free to uh, reach out if you have any questions. Um, we will be sharing resources related to this webinar in the post email. And we hope to see you next week in our upcoming session about hydroponics and aquaponics. So again, thank you all. Um, I hope you have a lovely evening. Uh, Saimar also shared their um, the direct link to the application. Thank you, Saimar, also providing um, our support in the background. Um, so again, there's a lot of resources out there. Feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions and it will be till next time. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.